Thank you for listening to The Path to Authenticity. My name's Tom Gentry. I think of this show as the opposite of small talk. You'll hear real conversations with real people who know who they are. We talk about what makes them who they are, how they became who they are, and how we might become truer expressions of who we are. This is Phil Treber, and this is The Path to Authenticity. your first time here thanks for checking it out if not thanks for coming back i'm tom gentry and this is the path to authenticity episode 217 for june 7th 2022 it features part one of a conversation with phil treber who's a therapist in south florida he has a practice called dude breathe And he's somebody I've gotten to know a little bit over the last couple years and someone I hope to get to know much better. We have some ideas about how we might collaborate. We uh, touched on a lot of stuff and had a compelling conversation. I think you're going to enjoy it. Got a lot of good things in the works. One of the things I'm working on, I've wanted to do... Nice t-shirts for the podcast pretty much all along. And I think I've found a reasonable way to do that, to find a relatively affordable, relatively high quality t-shirt and a way to create some other swag. So I'll be sharing more about that soon. Also, if you've been following me on Substack, I published a piece called The Boundaries Blueprint last week that I'm pretty excited about. Also put together a little e-booklet on boundaries. So you can find that through the links in the show notes. And in the meantime, I hope you enjoy this episode with Phil. So here you go, Phil Treber. The time leading up to this, I've thought a little bit about how we met. And, you know, we've only spoken a few times. Mm-hmm. But the you know we met when you were at next chapter. Yep. You know which was a fantastic trauma focused addiction treatment facility in South Florida. Mm-hmm. And you know I was working at a facility in the beginning, just f- facilitating groups with guys who were living in transitional housing and, uh, and some of them had gone through the program there. Yeah. And for me, you know, having been around that market for a long time and having worked in addiction treatment for a long time, I was really impressed with how prepared those guys were to just do well in recovery and in life. Mm Mm-hmm. And, and how they, they had an understanding of their family of origin issues. And I think the reason why that struck me so much is because, you know, when I had my treatment experience, my, my residential treatment experience, Mm -hmm. which was at a Hazelden facility, one of the best facilities in the country in the mid nineties. 23 years old, 
the shame, the family of origin stuff, all that, the message I got was, you'll work on that later. And, you know, all of us at some point when we're trying to, if we're going through something like this, want to know why. We want to understand why. And the message I got was it doesn't matter why. And I went with it. And and ultimately, you know, that's true. It's like you don't have to know why you're an alcoholic to stop drinking. That's not going to help you stop drinking. But there was a part of me that was wanted to know. I wanted to understand. I was curious. And and so I went years and years into recovery before I really started to tease that stuff out and understand myself better. And I was so happy for these guys new in recovery that they could do that in treatment, you know? Mm. And, uh, and I know because of that, those guys have a great chance at having a better quality of life than I had, like in the first eight or 10 years of my recovery. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, so we got to work with some of the same guys. And then also at that time, the place where I was working, one of the owners, I think you guys were in the same master's program, right? You and Paul? Yeah, that's right, Paul. Yeah, he was uh, like probably the oldest by far. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy was in his early 60s. Man, he had a bad heart and, uh, and he yeah. had a lot going on medically. Just died a couple months ago. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, I learned a lot from that guy. He, he, he was a businessman. He wasn't, you know. His life experience was amazing, you know, being, you know, working in the city up in New York and then kind of coming down here and, you know, really – you know, I, I've actually used him as an example of some of the older guys that I've worked with or guys that are trying to like thinking of switching their careers in their fifties or forties mm-hmm. and ah, it's too late for me. It's, I don't want to go back to school. And I'm like, you know, no, yeah, like you absolutely. Same thing with guys getting sober, coming into the rooms at 70 years old. I was like, it's never too late. Like you can do these things. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the thing about him, I mean, I really, like my position there, I started out doing groups and then, you know, I worked in transitional living a lot and did really well in that level of care. So when I got there, they needed help, you know, mm. and I could see you, you do a group somewhere, you know, whether what's going on. I mean, you know, what's sure. going on. You can get a sense of the culture. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was helping them work some stuff out and eventually they hired me to sort of help them, the two owners figure it out. And so here, you know, is this guy who's like 60 something years old who, you know, has been sober a long time, but he's never worked with people this way. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's sponsored guys, but that's it. But he was a natural man. He was so good with the guys. It it was, it was was that real world experience. It was that life experience. It was his heart, man. You know, that's really what it was. He was a loving guy. He was a loving guy. And, uh, and he believed in people. And, you know, one of the things that I've talked about and I've even written about that I learned from him, it's just, just was an eye opening thing. We were talking about some of the places that work with guys in that area, right? Like some of the sober residences and stuff. And there was one of them in particular that I was saying, you know, that's a great place. And he said to me, is it really a great place? (laughs) Or is it that it's just not a bad place? And it's not a crooked place. It's not an unethical place. And, you know, really, we're setting the bar pretty low here. And unfortunately that was, yeah, that sometimes that is the metric, especially down here, you know, a few years ago. Yeah. There was a time when like, I don't know, you know, so, but it just opened my eyes to really think about what I'm saying when it comes. But the, the, the thing about working in this industry that I'll say that 
I feel really lucky because of the people who were in leadership positions, where I worked, where I was treated in the beginning of my career. I mean, I got mm-hmm. really great training and so, you know, went through this Hazelden facility and I'll finish this and we'll move on. I, I, we, I want to talk about what you're doing now, obviously, but sure, no worries. No worries. I got to this place and I interviewed with this lady and she ran the residential treatment programs there. And, um, and she said, you know, I don't know if I can hire you. It's not my decision, but I want to hire you. She said, you know why I want to hire you? It's because I think you're here for the same reason I am. Because Mm -hmm. you want more of the grace that comes with sobriety. And I was like, wow, it just blew me away. And then a few months later, I'm working there. And, you know, I'm walking with her from one meeting to the next. And if you've ever been over to Hanley, I mean, there's a big courtyard with a fountain. and Yep, I know. She stopped me by that fountain and I, and I was just starting to work full time and train for a full time tech position over there. She stopped me and she pointed her finger in my face and looked in my eyes and she said, if you're in this to make money, go sell fucking cars, go sell houses. <laughs> That's not why we do this. That's not why we do this. Mm. And, and the things that she would say Like if there was something that didn't get done, the lens that she looked through, like uh, I I had to administer a lot of the MMPI, the psychological testing stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and when I, I wasn't the only one, but if somebody would miss that, miss something, miss some document or something wasn't in the chart that that's not good treatment. Mm-hmm. That everything that was the, is this good treatment or is this not good treatment? And then that was like in the, in the late nineties. And then when all these other places started to open, it was like, it was a copy of this and a copy of that copy and a copy of that copy and a copy of a copy. And it just, it just kept getting more and more watered down. But what has happened, I think, and over time is that the places that do really good treatment have stuck around, you know, and the places that don't, yeah. Yeah. The places that don't have closed, but Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, yeah, I just feel really lucky. And, you know, I, I imagine some of the people that you got to work with over there, you feel pretty lucky too. guys like Ryan Suave and I mean, good people. You know, who did yeah, good work. Good, like, yeah, like good clinicians like, you know, Malia. Oh, and just kind of, because that's when oh, I, I, when I first decided. To I'm the work. one who called her and said, you got to go work at this place. Really? Because I had worked with her at another place that shall remain nameless right now. <laughs> yeah. And it was a really bad experience for everybody there. And Yeah. Actually, Hugh Nash called me and asked me if I knew of anybody, and I called her when he was working there. Mm. Anyway, yeah, Malia, all star, you know. Yeah, I mean that was like my first real, besides my own treatment experiences, like when I was teching there, and I was like moved up to first shift lead. Like I would be there during the clinical days, and kind of just being in that environment. And there were times where even like when you know, I was able to sit in on meetings or trainings to kind of see the family of origin work, to see the pit training or mm-hmm. the pit therapy they're doing like Pia's model. And it was like, you know, it, throughout my entire history, you know, even with all my treatment episodes, like I would have my therapist say like, listen, dude, like if you ever get it together, like you would be good at this. Mm-hmm. I never really believed them, nor did I want to be a therapist. Yeah. But as I was there, I was like, this is the next natural step for me. And they were, you know, you know, that's when I actually soon after kind of, I was in school for a couple months, maybe a semester or two. And then that's when I went over to my other place that I worked at for a while. But that's like really kind of where it started because I saw that like the therapist cared, you know, I was on the other side of that experience of, you know, not sitting in groups and seeing therapists run interventions and, 
you know, it's us against them type of a mentality. I was much more a part of a team there. Yeah. And then that's, I mean, if you're going to do good work, I mean, that sort of atmosphere is critical. Like mm-hmm. You got to be working together, but yeah, you know, you mentioned Pia and Hey folks, Tom here. I want to take a moment to ask you to subscribe to my Substack publication. The original purpose for creating this podcast was to cultivate an audience for my writing, and I'm publishing now more than ever. I'm sharing free content every week with commentary on personal growth, emotional literacy, men's issues, relationships, and more, as well as audio content for paid subscribers. Please check it out by clicking the link in the show notes or by visiting tgentry at substack.com. Pia Melody, whose book, Facing Codependence, I'm looking at the spine on my desk right in front of me. I mean, yeah, my favorite is the intimacy factor. Okay. That one I haven't read, but uh, that one is, uh, that one's, yeah, that one's heavy. But, you know, it's <laughs> again going back to that, that work in that level of care, man. I mean, I talk about that book all the time because at the point that I read that book, Jimmy Hayward was sponsoring me. Mm. You know, Jimmy Hayward. He's one of the, you're one of the few only people who I've ever talked to on this podcast who know that name, but OG triple OG, such an incredible human being old school. Yeah. But, um, you know, I was going through a breakup and he's like, you're detoxing from codependency, dude. (laughs) And he started talking to me about five core symptoms. And at this point, I'd been an addictions counselor for over 10, you know, 10 years, you know, something. I mean, and I'd heard codependency thrown around, you know, people labeled for years and nobody ever mentioned anything to me about five core symptoms. And I got the book and I read it in a weekend and it changed my life, man. Mm. It helped me understand who I am. The intimacy factor, that was that for me because that's, it's all the inner child stuff, but it's really around intimacy and relationships. Yeah. That's where it really was for me that way. It's stuff that can help anybody really. Mm -hmm. But in going back to what I was saying before about that desire to know why I understood why after reading that book, I got it. Yeah. And, and that just was you know, the beginning of a direction down a whole other path of healing for me that, yeah. And I've actually done rooms on this, uh, app on clubhouse where I did a five week series where each week I read her little condensed section on the core symptoms and Mm -hmm. would cover one a week. And, um, you know, it's so helpful, but anyway, so you said you grew up in Long Island? Yeah, I was born and raised on Long Island. Okay. Yeah, in Nassau County up on the North Shore. Yeah. I assume you ended up in South Florida the same way that I did. Is that fair? Yep. I had a uh, air yep, air mailed down here for treatment, you know, and you know, so I was in New York and then I went to tr- my first treatment. I was at uh up in Connecticut and then went to sober living in Portland. And then came home, crashed and burned again, went to Arizona, came home, crashed and burned, you know, multiple detoxes in the middle of all those things. But I was, I was young, right. I was in my, you know, mid to late twenties, but you know, it wasn't like you were saying for me, it wasn't why, you know, I mean, I, I, even as a young kid, right. I grew up around, you know, like my family were successful businessmen and they drank hard and they partied hard. And I thought that there was nothing wrong with it. As long as like my per my my private life, whatever I was doing there, didn't interfere with my public life, and that was the dynamic that I saw. And I saw like I even like remember in like college, you know, calling myself an alcoholic because I could drink more than other people mm-hmm. and really hold it a lot differently. But I didn't know what it meant. But I was in. I always knew that there was some other like you know, clinical or developmental reason of why I was the way that I was. But for me. In the beginning, of course, like I'd gone through treatment and I'd been in therapy before and, 
you know, I understood things about my childhood and my development and my socialization process as a man or as a boy that became a man, you know, really didn't really become a man until my, you know, I was sober. But for me, it was like the, the, the way that the disease model was broken down to me. And I really gained a better understanding of it by, you know, at next chapter and, you know, working with guys like Andy and Johnny Vegas and those guys. And really that was sufficient enough for me. You know, I didn't really necessitate. I didn't really have that urging of a P I knew there was a piece missing, but it wasn't until I came down here and actually did the work. And then of course, after, you know, getting sober, continuing to do therapy, you know, I'm a therapist who has a therapist, right? right. Like I'm a sponsor who has a sponsor, right. you know, I'm, I'm a therapist who has a therapist to continue to keep digging. And, you know, I was talking to one of my guys in, in, in session last week about purpose and my purpose is not my career. It's not my, really my role, but like my purpose is my guiding force is to gain experience and knowledge and never stop learning about myself. And that was something that even when I was in active addiction for years, I always continued to try to grow and expand that out. And just probably in the past three or four years has really turned into like a much more deeper internal journey to figure out who I am and why I tick the way that I do. Mm -hmm. Right. But it was, you're right. You know, that's why I landed down here in South Florida, you know, to go to a treatment center that was supposedly 84 days. And, uh, I stayed the 84 and then, you know, because it was really much more about the, uh, the family dynamic of things going on, you know, I was doing everything right. I got out, you know, a lot sooner than a lot, a lot of my other peers did because of one, you know, we couldn't really afford it. Um, but two, because I was doing everything that I possibly needed to do to make sure that I didn't go back to the way that I was living beforehand. Hmm. That's it right there. Isn't it? I mean, it mm. really is simple. You said you were doing everything you possibly could to make sure that you didn't have to go back. I got really weird with it. Yeah. I got a little weird with it too. You know, yeah. I, I got to where when I, I don't know what you mean by weird, what I thought about was how I'd sit in group and treatment and I would hear the therapist talk about how his sponsor made him memorize how it works. And so I memorized how it worked mm -hmm. and how one of them would talk about how his sponsor made him start carrying his wallet in the opposite pocket and his keys in the opposite pocket from just that everything has to change. And I, I would do it, you know, I'd hear something like that and I would do it and I'd write stuff on my mirror and, you know, like, Oh yeah. You, I mean, I was, it was for me and the, the way I articulate it now to guys is it, my mantra was if I do this right this time, I will never have to do it again. Yep. And so I wasn't yep. going to cut any corners. You know, I knew how to work, man. I knew how to make money. I knew how to excel at a job. I needed to go to meetings. I needed to go to meetings. No, that was, no, yep. That be was in therapy, the all that, you know, have a sponsor, work the steps, all that stuff. I needed to do that. Yeah, I could build, I can build relationships again. I can work. I can do those things. But for me, you know, you know, within traditions, certain promises, that are there, but it was the 10th step for me, that position neutrality, that safe and protected. That was something that I didn't think was possible. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I said like, you know, get weird with it, you know, that meant diving into the history that mm -hmm. meant reading all these different types of books, expanding out my over, you know, my seven and a half years, you know, diving into philosophy, diving into spirituality, right? Three years ago, I became an initiated Vedic meditator. You know, I dove into yoga, stoicism, existentialism, you know, not so much the Germans and the French, but much more of like Frankel mm -hmm. and Yalom, like these other, you know, clinical, you know, with logotherapy and then kind of, you know, Yalom's unique approach, but just really challenging all of these beliefs that I had for so long and, and really building on these things that I didn't really have to change everything. I had to change my approach to these things. To where it was like, you know, because I remember meditating high. Mm. I remember meditating and reading spirituality drunk. 
Yeah. Right? Cause I knew that there was something else out there. And at times I felt that higher self, that capital S self at times, right. those moments of clarity to where I knew it was there, but I just had to pull across and that's, you know, the continued therapy and the continued growth of pulling out of those blocks that were blocking me from that higher self, you know, that mm. capital S self that we talk about in internal family systems, which I'm really digging into a lot more recently, but it was like kind of just reworking the things that I'd done in the past and actually giving this thing a fair shot mm. and understanding and having, you know, what those guys told me in the beginning of my first 90, 180 days of literally just really trying to embody this idea that I never have to live that way again mm. and really try to believe them. And yeah. I believe them and I, I don't. You know, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. And I'm, I mean, like, there's a lot of what you're saying that I just relate to so much, especially uh, just the, the – I talk to guys about how what I noticed when I first started coming around is that the the guys who stayed were the ones who kept working on themselves and never mm. stopped. I told the guy that in yeah. today. And I, I, I that's, yeah. that's what I've done. Like I, I it's it. There was never any, okay. If I'll be done with this at some point. No, no, this is a way of life. But I was talking about to somebody, I can't remember who it was. It was yesterday, but how it's like, Living this way is like having a color television. Your life is like color TV after being in black and white your whole entire life. I mean, mm. it's so much richer, so much more joyful, like just being able to be present. And I know I have so much more to learn and, and it gets better. I know it gets better because it has always gotten better. Yep. No, I'm, I'm never done. Like I say, like I, I literally, like one of my other lo little personal mantras is that it's a line from a Daft Punk song. <laughs> you know, if they, if they, it's a, and our work is never over. Hmm. Right. And of course it's in there, you know, the computer technological voice, but that's it. My work is never over. The yeah. minute that I stop pushing myself to grow and challenging myself and and of course, like, and I've had to find balance over this in years. And I was in therapy probably four or five years ago about finding balance and not being so black and white with growth and learning actually how to like just relax and kick back as opposed to just grinding it out, which is an issue that I see in my practice with men frequently. Yeah. But understanding that, you know, you know like the Kaizen method, just 1% better each day. Just one one percent, just trying to just tweak this and tweak that, and at times it comes out black and white. You know, like I literally was laughing with a client earlier today about how I wish I had three extra hours per day, and he was like, "What would you do with it?" I was like, "I would read." Mm -hmm. I was like, "Because I I need to come home after sessions with guys and and running my business, and I need to go for a walk and I need to watch Netflix for an hour, I need to like decompress, but then." You know, I read voraciously. I read every single night. It's part of my like nightly routine. But at some times, I'm just like my brain just can't like absorb the information or want to, and it's frustrating because yeah. there's so much to learn, there's so much to read that I'm just like I wish I had three extra hours where I could just read and dive in and do this and do that. But I know that that would just be another you know polarizing black and white approach to life that I've struggled with before. <laughs> All right, so. One of the things that uh, I've really admired is the name of your practice, you know, mm. tell, tell everybody the name of your practice. My uh, practice is dude breathe counseling. Yeah. I, as soon as I saw that, I think it was a Facebook post or something that it was original and, um, and just good. Like something that I think people will respond to. They have. And it, it's attractive, you know, and it's playful. Right. And that's really important when working with men. You know, I mean, I've, I've dove into the men's psychology and the men's issues world. And there's actually a lot of research about the words that we use and the approach that we can take with men as clinicians that can really help remove the stigma, but also get them through the door. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you know, I remember I talked to you probably maybe over a year ago now about, you know, starting a men's group due to your experience with it. And I did some research, I uh, forget where I read it, but they, I think it was up at UMass, they did some research about, they want to do support groups for men around depression. And they, you know, control a group in a placebo or whatever. And the one of the names of the groups that they tried was a depression group for men. Can you imagine how many yeah. guys signed up for it? <sighs> Almost none. Yeah. Almost none. But then when they actually called it the stresses of life group, tons of guys showed up because stress is okay. Right. We're allowed to say that we're stressed out. There's no stigma attached to stress because it's something like that depression. No, no, no. I'm a man. I'm not allowed to be depressed. So when I came up with the name, it kind of came up like organically. And I didn't want to go with the Treber psychotherapy or, you know, I have, I'm a big Greek mythology guy. So I thought like Prometheus psychotherapy or Phoenix you know, psychotherapy, Mm -hmm. which I I love all that metaphor and story. I'm a huge Joseph Campbell guy and Mm -hmm. Carl Jung guy. But I knew that if I was going to like kind of shift gears away from the substance abuse specifically and really focus much more on the men's issues, I needed to have a name that was one authentic to me with my playfulness and my use of humor and, you know, making kind of, you know, light on things that we're not supposed to make light of, but then also make it approachable for guys. So I appreciate you recognizing that it is that yeah. know, difference and playful. And yeah, I mean, every time I have to say it's slow because, you know, people like dude breathe counseling. Yeah. Yeah. No, like, it's oh dude. God, it's, yeah. Breathe. Breathe. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, and I like <laughs> being a guy who like, I've, I mean, one thing I've had like all through my sobriety is I, I may have not always been actively in individual therapy. Yeah. But I always at least had access to somebody or, but it, it's, it's, I've always felt like it was, and I've used it like a tool most of that time. I've, well, if there's something, well, most recently, I, you know, I, the one, I was, I was at a place in my life where I had to figure out the love relationship stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so more than once, I, in my life, I have with a therapist walked through the process of entering into a relationship and going through the whole relationship, processing it with a therapist as I did it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, it was huge. You know, it was huge. Because the same thing with me, it's like, it's been, it's been the same way. Like, you know, years ago when I was in my first like real quote unquote real relationship in sobriety, you know, I wasn't the healthiest. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, my, my attachment style was anxious and, you know, I had to do some deeper work into why I was picking specific partners and why I was moving towards these people. And most recently I re-engaged with uh, a therapist down here who actually did a lot of her training directly with Pia mm-hmm. to do some other inner child work and some brain spotting type stuff to kind of work through anxieties and my attachment style within relationships. And of course, like on paper, right. I'm going to be like, wow, like he he's healthy. Why is he in therapy? Right. Right. But the thing was, is that I had some other things I need to work out on. And, you know, the same thing, like I saw her, you know, uh, weekly at first and then bi-weekly and now it's every three weeks. And now I think we're about to you know, go like a month, a month and a half in between mm-hmm. sessions because everything I've kind of like leveled up in those specific areas of my life to where, you know, honestly, man, let's like I got out of a relationship and I saw some red flags and it went sideways on me. And then I took a step back and instead of trying to fill that validation place, what I would normally do years and years ago in my sobriety, it's like, no, no, I'm going to date myself for read every night. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to read every night. I'm going to take care of myself and focus on my health. I'm going to be okay just being by myself and get used to that uncomfortable feeling without reaching externally for some level of validation and just get right with self before, you know, I do, you know, instead of the, you know, apps and everything else like that, right. Just kind of let the universe take its role as opposed to trying to shove a relationship into my life. And I think that was a, yeah, big learning. This is something Jimmy Hayward talked to me about. Because he was my divorce sponsor. That's what he mm. was. You know, 
But he mm-hmm. talked about, and he's a perfect example of this. You just look at his energy. When you grow, when you get healthier, when you get better, when you get closer to God, you radiate love and positive energy that attracts people. It's funny that you say that because one of the things that I said, like getting weird with it is that I'm a very logically scientifically oriented guy, mm-hmm. right? Like in the beginning, my, my sense of a higher power was the Fibonacci sequence was the golden ratio was mm-hmm. the scientific facts that we had, like, you know, Carl Sagan with the universe and all these higher levels of thought that would not disprove a higher power, but would show some type of evidence for it. And three or four years ago, the universe saw fit to bring two women into my life that are some of my, you know, closest people now, even though life has kind of brought us apart, but that were deeply spiritually hippie astrology, yogi energy type women, which was something that was so foreign to me. (laughs) But when I get weird with it, right, I have to expand myself out to look at these things. And the reason why I brought this up was about two months ago, I went to this woman in West Palm Beach. And she was like kind of not a medium, but a spiritual guide. Okay. And I sat down with her and she just started going at me, right? Just started talking. And I was like, whoa, 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 can I record this? And she's like, yes. And the way that she framed it to me was that she the archangels speak through her and guide her. And I was sitting there. I was like, all right, well, all right, this is kind of okay. But the, she said that Archangel Michael, Uriel and Theo were with her. And the things that she was pointing out to me, and the things that she was saying to me are things that I cannot explain. I cannot put logical reasoning that you cannot Google these things. You cannot Facebook these things. And she told me, and the same thing that you were just saying is that I have done all the work I possibly can do myself. I've aligned myself with the temporal work, the therapy, the growth, the spirituality in the, in the aspect of having a spiritual experience and approaching my life from a different standpoint to where I've been inwardly reorganized, Mm -hmm. right? But she said, I'm not at the right frequency. I'm not putting out the right energy. And the way that she framed it was like, you're, it's like you're sitting at the window with your antenna up saying, love, where are you? But your frequency is off, therefore you're not attracting it. And there's two sides of me. One side is like, all right, cool, down with it An answer. This is weird. I'm here for it. You know, it's almost validating to know the work that I've done. But the other side of me is like, what the hell is she talking about? Yeah. Frequency, right? And it's like that's the battle that I think I've gone through over my past couple of years about expanding out my my knowledge and my understanding or openness to these different levels of these things to where instead of trying to control or have a logical explanation to them, just go with it. Mm. Right. And just be authentic to what I'm feeling inside as opposed to second guessing these feelings and these emotions and trying to dump all of them into an Excel spreadsheet and running the algorithms and regressions that I can come out with like a clear answer at the end. Yeah. Well, this is something we do as guys, man. We want to think our way out of feeling Mm -hmm. and it will never, ever work. It will never, ever work, you know? Right. Like I said, I've, I've said it to guys in session in the past just the t- yesterday and today alone, I'm like, I'd look at them I'm like, listen, man, your gut's telling you something, but you're trying to put it into these boxes of these clear, logical answers, dude. And it's not going to work. Yeah. You got to feel it. You got to feel it. And I'll tell you one of the things that you reminded me of listening to you and that experience that you had with her. One of the big sort of, I guess, developmental milestones for me in the last five years or so was coming to the recognition that the love that I was pursuing in the unavailable person and the love that I was experiencing 
I mean, overwhelmingly powerful, deep feelings of love, connecting the dots that that didn't come from that other person. It's obvious. It wasn't reciprocated. Mm -hmm. It wasn't happening because I was like you, like the anxious attachment style who looks for the avoidant or doesn't even look for it, just ends up with. Oh, that anxious avoidant loop. Uh. And to realize that that love wasn't from another person. It was in me before. Mm. I already had what I was looking for. And so that helped for me. I mean, you know, being a guy, you got to relate to this. The whole you got to love yourself thing. (laughs) <laughs> most of my recovery, it's been fucking bad. Like, what are you talking about? Like, what does that even mean? Yeah. But, but it clicked for me and I was closer to it before that, but that's when it really clicked. Mm-hmm. Like this overwhelming feeling of affection that I have, that I want to transmit out to somebody that I want to give to somebody else. Just stop and treat myself that way yeah that was the inner child thing for me and i think as you say that right is i'm on i'm on the precipice of that in my current development right for the probably for the past two years since i opened up my private practice and really started to beat to my own drum i've gotten more and more of this autonomy this level of comfort this level of a confidence almost, but with the self love, I mean, I think that's a journey that I personally will always be on and I've gotten some significant tastes of it, but when it comes to expressing that to another, it's hard to articulate and I want to so desperately, but it's like, there's this, this feeling of this fantasy, right? Because I do want a family. I do. I, 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 wholeheartedly adhere to the sacred feminine, the sacred masculine, and the joining of these energies as a spiritual experience and not so much of this, you know, role play of I'm the man, you're the woman, we have a family, but this spiritual connection that I think I've been looking for for so long in the wrong places and really honestly settling in relationships and not trusting my gut on these things. But it's this like, this wholehearted feeling of this fire, this anxiety, this anxiousness, this excitement, this level of love that I'm I'm like on the precipice of experiencing for myself, but still, you know, knowing that, and I know logically, I know clinically that I know I need to experience it for myself before I'm able to give it to somebody else. And the funny thing is, is that I didn't tell this spiritual lady that I was dating myself for six months. And she said, you're going to date yourself until July and then things will start to line up for you. And I'm like, all right, cool. But then I'm driving home. I listen to it again, right directly after, because that's how I need to ingrain this information in my mind. And I did the math. And at the time when I said I was going to date myself for six months, that ends up being July. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Right? Like wild. And then I, I didn't tell her about like all the things I want to do and how I want to speak publicly about the men's psychology and men's issues and how I want to have a group practice and blow this thing up and maybe even write a book in the future. She mentioned those things right. that Archangel Michael and all those guys were telling her, which was like, I can't, it's, I don't like it, Tom. I don't like it. I can't explain it. Like the re- religiosity aspect of it, you mean? No, not even the real. Like, I'm down with it, right? Like I think it's all the same pasta, different sauces. Right. Like, I'm down right. with the archangels. <laughs> I'm down with Shiva and the Buddha and Islam, and like I'm cool with all of those different pantheons of gods manifesting and all their different things. I don't like how she told me those things without having that information already. I can't explain it. I don't like it. Right. Well, you, it's powerlessness. Yeah. I don't like it. I like to have control. I like to be able to have answers on these things, but it's these levels of, and as I come against these resistance levels and these, these different levels of the onion within myself, that that's where I almost have enjoyment of having that discomfort level inside and knowing that, okay, this is the path. This is the way as the Mandalorians would Mm. say. Yeah. Right. Cause I'm a big star Wars guy. 
but just understanding like, okay, when I take my hands off and step back, things line up like a proper third, right? Mystery. There's something sacred about mystery. And for me to frame that stuff that way and the way that I have explained it to guys like, uh, I can look at it like, oh my God, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Or I can look at it like, oh my God, I don't know what's going to happen. Like it could be (laughs) awesome. (laughs) Like I have no idea how good it could be. And, and the evidence in my life, and I'm sure you can say the same. I can. I mean, it, it, it tells me that it's going to be way better than I've envisioned. Yep. Whatever it is that's coming next, it's going to be way better than I thought or, you know, a whole, wholeheartedly. And, it, and it's funny because for me, the mystery right? I can classify that as one within spirituality, but then two also with deep empirical clinical experience, right? To where there's this uh, neuroscientist, I think Dan Siegel, he wrote this book, The Mindful Therapist. And it is, it's a, it's, it's a brain buster, right? Like this guy is on a whole nother level, but the first, I've had to probably read the first chapter of that book 17 times, but he talks about these peaks of probability and how when we've already gone to decide what is going to happen, it removes our ability to be open and conscious and spontaneous in the moment. And he's talking mm-hmm. about it from a therapist's point of view, right? Being in session with a guy and just being curious and just being open to what's going on, the realm of possibilities is expansive. But the same thing is that in the past like year, I've really dove deep into the thinking and the mythology as well as the spirituality of the indigenous peoples here in America, specifically Mm. the Lakota tribes. Mm. And there's this great book called thinking indigenous by Doug Goodfeather. And when you said mystery, they talk about within the indigenous people of America's right. There's great spirit, which is the embodiment of the great mystery, you know, Wakana Thanka. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that mystery is just the mystery. You can't explain it. But yeah. that it's embodied within the great spirit, which then embodies, you know, all, you know, the, the cardinal directions as well as above, which is masculine and below, which is Mother Earth, which is the feminine, where all life comes from. But that that speaks to me at such a core, deep level of that mystery and the comfort that I can take in it now compared to year two, five years, yeah. three years. for listening to the show please subscribe leave a rating or a review at apple podcasts or wherever you listen you can learn more about my other podcasts by visiting the path to authenticity.com or by clicking the link in the show notes the music is by the band punk rock opera used under a creative commons license and with permission from the artist. The show is produced by me, Tom Gentry. You can find more of my work on Substack, including a podcast only available to paid subscribers. So again, thanks for listening. Keep coming back. Be nice.
did great, honey. 